Good evening, class. My name is Jeff Uhall, and I'm going to talk to you about the Battle for Okinawa. The Battle for Okinawa was the first part of what was a planned full-scale invasion of the islands of Japan. They needed to establish a bridgehead to maintain their line of communication, and Okinawa provided the perfect place to be able to do that. The operation was a joint operation between the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps, where the 5th Fleet would provide the naval bombardment support and transportation to get to the island of Okinawa. It would ultimately be the 24th Corps of the Army, which consisted of four divisions, and the 3rd Amphibious Corps of the Marine Corps, uh, which ultimately would land on the beaches. The strategic objectives were to establish a bridgehead within 400 miles of Japan and a logistical support base for ships and aircraft, and also to be able to eliminate the resistance along the line of communication of the Allied forces. Essentially, if they were to seize all of the, the intervening space between Okinawa and the southernmost islands of main Japan, they would have to be able to protect that uh, so that they wouldn't have to worry about being attacked in the rear, uh, disrupting their ability to send either personnel or materiel forward. The Japanese defense was planned out by a strategist named uh, Hiromichi Yahara, and the plan was essentially that they would slash and burn everything across the island. They would relegate the food stores of the population uh, away from rice and make them eat sweet potatoes. They would kill all the livestock. And the defense itself would be, would be comprised of two main characteristics, the first of all being a sectionalized defense, uh, where they would break up their units into different sectors of operation. And then it would also be conversely defense in depth. Uh, because of the terrain in the southwesternmost part of the island, they decided that would be where they would have their final stand, uh, if you will. So that was the main consensus behind the establishment of defenses on Okinawa by the Japanese forces. The Battle of Okinawa came right on the coattails of the Battle of Iwo Jima, um, and really right at the end of that conflict, which lasted over five weeks, came the Battle of Okinawa, which would ultimately last three months. Um, it was begun with a naval bombardment where shells were fired from 5th Fleet onto the defenses, um, and even though reconnaissance had given them an idea of what the terrain was like, they still went ahead with a bombardment that ultimately would not be as helpful or successful as anticipated. Um, the reverse slope hillside defilade fighting positions of the Japanese would also uh, be very hard to destroy with aerial attacks, and those would ultimately provide uh, great cover and concealment for the Japanese forces who were able to establish their fighting positions uh, with interlocking fields of fire, pre-designated kill zones, um, and target reference points for their artillery. Um, so the bombardment covered UDT operations as well, where the underwater demolition teams of the Navy, uh, the Navy frogmen, um, came in and tried to sweep for mines and clear out underwater obstacles with demolitions. Uh, the 10th Army landing itself uh, it started uh, 26 March at a nearby archipelago uh, called the Karama Islands, um, and that was going to be the, the resting place for the naval pieces that weren't in action at any point throughout the stage of the invasion, uh, because it was a very secure, uh, almost square-shaped set of four islands uh, that provided natural cover for the ships. Uh, the Marine Reconnaissance Battalion seized coastal islands on 31 March 1945, uh, and the Joint Forces land on the western side of Okinawa on uh, 1 April 1945 at the Hagushi beaches, uh, really centrally located on the western side of Okinawa. Uh, when the, the Joint Forces got ashore, the Army units moved to the south, and the Marine Corps units of 3rd Amphibious Corps moved to the north. The Japanese response didn't begin in earnest until 6 April. Uh, when the invasion forces got onto the beaches, they met no resistance. Uh, and the Japanese response actually begun 
uh, with 400 planes flying from nearby Kyushu, Kyushu to attack the Allied naval forces. And that was the beginning of a series of a lot of different significant raids that would happen where kamikaze pilots would go on suicide missions to be able to destroy as much of the naval support as possible. Um, and then the Operation Ten Go uh, was the Japanese capital ship Yamato and nine other ships uh, basically trying to go out and destroy what they could of the naval support forces for the Allies. Uh, but it was an overwhelming victory for the American fleet where 300 planes or more were put up into the air to attack the Yamato. Uh, and they inflicted heavy casualties. And the Yamato itself, which was the Japanese Pride and Joy battleship, their capital ship, uh, was destroyed. The, um, the ship Yamato is worthy of investigation just because it was so large. It's like the largest battleship to have ever been sent uh, onto the sea. So its displacement was 72,000 tons uh, when it was fully complemented with uh, personnel material. It was just shy of, of 840 feet. Its top speed was 27 knots. Its crew complement was 3,233 personnel, and its armament consisted of three 18-inch guns, which were the largest guns, and then a myriad of other guns and aircraft that were able to help support while the uh, ship was in action. Because of the limited available troops for the Japanese military to be able to defend the island of Okinawa, they decided instead of trying to man all of the coastline, they decided to fall back to positions that would be more easily defensible because of the terrain. Uh, so they broke it down into sectors and they had lines of advance um, where they would set up uh, more robust defenses in lines that they could have uh, fallback positions every time one would ultimately get overrun. And that defense in depth is still something that armies today use. Uh, even with modern equipment. And it's one of the primary factors that army engineers plan for. So the fighting positions that the Japanese established were, reveal, were re reverse hill slope positions. And these positions were in defilade so that they would essentially be very hard to hit with strafing fire from support aircraft and very hard for the infantrymen to get to. Uh, and they had interlocking fields of fire, which meant that every one of those positions would cover all the space between itself and another fighting position. And uh, because they were so well tied into the terrain, uh, they were able to effectively canalize American forces into kill zones. And they would have target reference points put on those kill zones so that they'd be able to drop artillery or mortar fire on top of those positions where they were choke pointing the American soldiers. And they had orders to fight to the last man. Um, the heaviest fighting um, came about on the lower half of the island. The Marines were able to take the northern half of the island relatively quickly. Uh, by the middle of April, the armies advanced down through the south part of the island had been slowed down, and the stiffest resistance was in the bottom one-eighth of the island, where the terrain was the uh, most disadvantageous to the advancing forces. Some of the Marine forces had to redirect after they had completed their sweep of the northern half of the island to help get the 24th Corps uh, able to advance towards their objectives. Um, the final pockets of resistance did indeed fight to the death until there was mass suicide uh, conducted by 4,000 sailors and soldiers of the Imperial Armed Forces. Some of the key terrain features that had to be seized. Uh, the first in the 24th Corps advance was Cactus Ridge, and it was south of Mashiki. Uh, and that was really the f beginning of concentrated resistance that the 24th Corps had run into. Uh, the man-made obstacles were so well t tied into the natural terrain that the, the 24th Corps really got bogged down 
and spent a lot more time than they had initially planned on being there. Uh, and then we have what was called the pinnacle, which was a very easily defensible position on a 450 foot coral ridge that was south of Arakachi, Okinawa. And then the Kakazu Ridge Line was a steep hill near one of the significant airports, the um, and the bloodiest fighting of Okinawa occurred there. Um, the nearby population center provided a lot of civilian conscripts to help aid the trained soldiers in the defense of the Kakazu Ridge Line. The longest stall was the next stop, and that was the Machinato Defense Line. And the casualties mounted because they just got stuck in this position that got bogged down, and they also experienced heavy rains. So not only were the enemy forces slowing down the American advance, but it seemed like nature was conspiring against them too. Ultimately, the Shuri line was the last line of defense, and it happened just south of the town of Shuri. Uh, that was the final organized um, uh, line of defense, and ultimately when it fell, the Itoman resistance was the last collective of Japanese resistance in the southern, southeasternmost portion of the island. And... Um, Ultimately, as it, the situation panned out, 4,000 Japanese uh, ended up committing ritualistic suicide. Um, and then throughout uh, the latter half of June, the mop-up operations and the official announcement was made on 22nd June uh, that the island had fallen. Uh, the commanders of the operation... Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, who's the commander of the Pacific Ocean areas, uh, really kind of the most important land personnel were Lieutenant General Simon Buckner, who unfortunately was killed uh, towards the end of the operation on 18 June. Uh, he was the commander of the 10th Army, and uh, General Roy Geiger was the commander of the 3rd Amphibious Corps. Uh, Admiral Raymond Spruant. Uh, replaced Admiral William Halsey of the Gulf of Leyte fame. He was the outgoing uh, commander and was replaced by uh, Raymond Spruance, and that's when the, uh, the fleet changed. The Japanese commanders, the 32nd Army was the, the mainstay of the Japanese land resistance, and that fell under General Mitsuru Ushijima. Uh, his chief of staff was was Isamu Cho. Um, the chief strategist, as mentioned before, was Hiromichi Yahara. The commander of the naval forces was Oroku Minora Ota. And um, he basically held out on the Oroku Peninsula. And Admiral Saichi Ito was the commander of the Tengo Offensive Task Force that involved the sinking of the Yamato. The results of the battle, uh, 12,500 were killed in action and approximately 45,000 were wounded in action on the, size of the ally, on the side of the Allies. Japanese losses included approximately 77,200 uh, killed in action Japanese soldiers, 30,000 killed in action Okinawan conscripts, 100,000 missing and assumed dead uh, Okinawan civilians, and that's based off of a median average between roughly 44,000 and 150,000, uh, and approximately 10,000 captured Japanese sailors, soldiers, and conscripts at the end of operations, given as a grand total. The strategic impacts of the invasion of the island of Okinawa uh, it took 82 days, and there was war correspondents who were essentially sending home images of the battle, which really let the American public see how violent it was. And ultimately, um, the, uh, the force projection provided by Okinawa was essential, but they made the decision to drop the two nuclear weapons because this battle and how bloody it was made the, the chiefs of staff realize that the stiff resistance was going to amount to an unacceptable casualty. 
uh, in currents, both in terms of the civilians and military of Japan, but also of the uh, Allied forces. So they decided to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and August 9th, respectively. And that's probably the biggest strategic impact of the Battle of Okinawa, is that just the stiff resistance was enough to finally um, bring about the decision to use the atomic bomb. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing the rest of the class's presentations. Thank you.